looking at this dice game to first of all see what we can do with the ASP.NET controls. Uh, what can you do with the ASP.NET controls? You can do anything with ASP.NET controls. You have a whole bunch of properties on any ASP.NET control. And you can initialize those properties through Visual Studio. All right. That is, you can go and you can set something invisible, or you can set an image, or you can set the color of something, or you can set this property of, of a control or that property of a control. So you can set all these different properties of the control through the through uh, um, Visual Studio. But you can also set them programmatically. And that's where the dynamic part of the web page comes. And um, you'll see that in... in just about everything that we're working on, we're gonna we're gonna look at properties of the controls. We're gonna change them, all right, based on some criteria, and it's gonna be our C sharp code that does that. And typically, that C sharp code is gonna be tied to some user action. The user presses a button. The user selects something from a drop down or whatever. So let's look at this. So that's one of the things that we are looking at in this example. Okay. The other thing that we are looking at in this example is our ability to um, take code and put it in classes so that it's reusable. All right. We don't. That's not the sole purpose of this class, but I think you should understand that you can do it and how you would do it if you needed to do it. So that's an important thing to realize. So therefore, I know some of you talked about like not having a lot of uh, experience creating classes in uh, the intro to C sharp class um, or, or whatever. And that's fair. If you take advanced C sharp, which, which you all probably should if you have an opportunity to, if it fits in your curriculum, or even if it doesn't fit in your curriculum, you'll really spend a lot of time focusing on objects and classes. And you can, you can pick up some great skills and learn some great things in there. This is sort of showing you how this hooks into a web page. Um, that these are two different things. It's interesting, but a lot of people, even, even some people um, in the field, somehow think of web development as different than like regular programming or conventional programming. It really isn't. You're doing the same stuff. You're doing it in a different environment, though. That's all. Same thing with mobile, mobile programming. You know, the only difference is, is, is the, the device that's going to be deployed on is a mobile device. And there's some characteristics unique to a mobile device as opposed to a desktop computer. Just like there's some uh, characteristics of applications that are viewed within a web browser compared to uh, an application you deploy on a personal computer. But really, it's still programming. You're doing everything. You're just working in a different environment. So let's bring this up and let's refresh your memory about what it does. And then we'll, st we'll spend some time looking at, at the code. If you have not already, um, sometime before Tuesday next week, look at your project. Uh, look at the project of the assignment. All right, because we will talk about that almost certainly next week. All right. Default.aspx. Again, remember that that is assumed to be your application's home page. Therefore, the first page that you create for any application probably should be called default.aspx. Do not, however, call the next one default1.aspx and default2.aspx. Give them a meaningful name. All right? Um, we're going to run this, and our, our main page is default. So we're going to run this code, and we're going to observe how it works, and then we're going to look at the coding involved. Yes. When you say give them a meaningful name, so like if you, it like totally freaks me out to change the names on things in Visual Studio, how do you safely change those names? Oh, it totally freaks me out to change names in Visual Studio. Um, 
Honestly, what I typically do is I will create and copy and paste code to a new one because there's like several places you have to do it. Uh, I think you can do it, but like you'd have to go and change this and change this and change in the code behind file. Change this. So I think if you change in all those places, it will work. But I've had a lot of problems. So with how that. would you? Because you said you didn't want them to be called the ball dot Like how would you? Oh, how would you? Well, the the first one should be called ASPS. How do you how do you change the second one? Yeah. When you go new. When you create it. When you create it, yeah. New. You're still, you're still okay. Let me get out of debug then. So file, new file, web form, down here you don't oh, give okay. it the name. Right. Thank you. All right. Okay, so let's go and run this. We have our drop down to make a choice. We have validation here. If you click that, it gives us must make a selection. You pick, you can pick for the roll of the two dice, two to six, eight to twelve, or seven. All right. Um, When you roll the two dice, if you pick low and you roll the sum of two to six, then you win. Or if you pick high and you roll an eight to 12, you win. If you pick seven and you roll a seven, you win. Um, the payoffs are different though. You get paid off one to one for low or high. You get paid off four to one for seven. A quick, uh, a quick glance at statistics will tell you that you are doomed to lose this game over time, as with all gambling games, right? Because what is the chances of rolling a seven? How many possibilities are there for two dice? There's six dots. There's six. There's, there goes one through six. So there's six possibilities. Twelve. Not twelve. 36 possibilities. How many sevens, how many ways can you get Can you get seven? You can get seven six different ways, right? One and six, two and five, three and four, four and three, five and two, six and one. So there's six possibilities to get seven, and there's 36 total possibilities. So, your chance of winning is 6 out of 36, or 1 out of 6. However, they're paying you off 4 to 1, all right? So, they're paying you off less than what your odds are, all right? Um, so, you're doomed to lose. If you analyze the other cases, um, they're paying you 1 to 1, and your odds are less than 50-50 to roll a 2 to 6 or 8 to 12, and therefore... Um, your, your odds are, you know, there's 15, 36 chance to roll, or 5 out of 8, 16, 36, or, no, 5 out of 12. You have a 5 out of 12 chance to win if you pick the other categories, and they're paying you off 1 to 1. So if it was 6 out of 12, then they'd be paying you off. I, I, this is one of those tangents that um, I should just probably stop. All right. The point is, it's like with any of these any of these gambling games, your your odds of winning are not good. All right. So I make a choice. I roll. I lost. You lost. I pick a seven. I roll. I also lost. Oh, I won. You lost. All right. So we know what's going on. Let's go and revisit uh, all the different pieces of this 
uh, so that we understand. We can almost, in our mind, see what .NET controls are there. There are, there is, a dropdown. There's a validator control for that dropdown. There's a button. There's a validator control. We have two images and a label. So we can sort it in our head, and, and that's, again, a good step to go through is when you look at these examples, maybe take a second and think, like, what is on here? All right? The other thing we know is that there's code on the on-click event of this guy. So if we click this, that initiates the code to execute. All right? So let's look and see what we have in this example. Let's first look at the UI. And everyone knows what I mean when I say the UI, right? The UI is the user interface. So it's typically going to be the HTML-ish part of this uh, uh, little application. In other words, it's going to be the ASPX page. All right, that's the UI. That's what the user interacts with. That's what generates HTML that the user goes and does their thing on. So sure enough, here's the dropdown. Here's the button. Here's our validator control. Here's our two images, and here is the result label. We can also see it this way, if you prefer. I also have a panel here. All right? This could probably work without the panel. All right? But I think I put it in here just to reinforce kind of the example that we did, uh, one of the earlier examples that we did. All right. That way I can, instead of showing or hiding the individual elements, I can show or hide the panel. All right. Yes? How would you do it without the drop down? Like, let's say you just wanted to click go and it would just give you a random in image and say, for instance, rock, paper, scissors, you lost, you have scissors or rock. So you want me to code the assignment then? No. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me think about what you're asking. So, I'll tell you what. Let's go through this one, and then we'll go back and answer your question. Okay? Because then, then we'll, we can have maybe something to compare it to. All right, we can say, well, this is how you did it in this example, this is how you did it, and this is how you might do it for rock, paper, and scissors. All right. Notice that the validator control is a required field, which means they have to pick a choice. Remember, a dropdown always has a choice picked, right? If we look at this, we have our items. The first item, which is our dummy choice, has a value of negative 1. All right? And our other values are 0, 1, and 2. When we create the validator control, then, for this, it's a required field validator. The control to val validate is drop down list 1. And the empty answer is negative 1. The initial value is negative 1. That's how it knows that you haven't made a selection if the, if, if the value of it matches the initial value. So that's how you get around sort of the restriction that a dropdown is always going to have some value, unlike a text box, which could have no value. All right? You define what the initial value is, and so if it ends up with the initial value, the user hasn't made a choice, and you can tell them. We, we wouldn't have to absolutely make this with a required field validator and that dummy selection on top, but I think it's better because I don't think you want to default that choice. The user in a game like this should deliberately make the choice that they want. All right. So then when they lose all their money, they can't come back and say, hey, it defaulted to low. I really wanted it to be high. Well, too bad. All right. So we put a validation in there uh, to, to force them to pick something. All right, if we look on the button, again, I'm, so, I'm sort of using this also to review everything that we've talked about so far. If we look on the button, we'll notice that the button says on click button roll underscore click. All right, 
That is saying that this button is tied to the function button roll click. How do we tie it to the button? Usually, you don't have to do anything special. Usually, if you double click on it, it if that function isn't there, it will create it for you. And it will create that on click event to say that this button is tied to that button click. All right? So usually you don't have to do anything to do that. But you should be aware that this property is there. And this property needs to be set to tie this button to that clicking, uh, that, that, that code. Because if that isn't there, then that code doesn't execute. So it's not based on like the name of the function, button roll underscore click. It's based on the fact that there's an on click event here. So if I were to delete this, all right, and run this, what's going to happen when I press the button? Absolutely nothing. Nothing, of course. Because there's no code associated with that. The other trap to fall into is, let's say I didn't want code associated with the button click. Let's say I wanted to do it some other way. If I went into my code behind and got rid of this function, Alright, if I went and run, ran this, I'm going to get an error. Alright, what is the error telling me? If we read down here, ASP default doesn't contain a definition for button roll click and no extension method, blah, 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 blah. Alright, what that is telling you is this button has associated with it an on-click event. And yet, in the code behind, there is no on-click event. So if you get that error, usually I get that error if I accidentally double-click something, create an event, it ties the event to the control, then I stop and think and say, oh, wait a minute, I don't want, I don't want that. So I delete the, 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 the code. Well, if you delete the code, you also have to go back and delete the reference to it, the on-click or on-change or whatever the event is. Okay. So what happens when we click the button? I create two integers, three integers. One for the value of dice one, one for the value of dice two, and one for the total of the two dice. So I have a D1, D2, and a total. I also set a Boolean for whether the person won or not. I also set an integer for the user's choice. One thing you'll notice with me, I think my coding style, and I think it was this way even before I started teaching. I don't think this is a case of me changing the way I code because I'm teaching. Is I tend to write out several simple steps instead of a, a, a few complicated steps. So I do, I'll, I declare the variable, I'll set the variable, I'll do this. Some people can write all that, and, and, and I could too if I chose to, you can write all that maybe in one or two set, uh, statements. But I prefer to put every single step because I think it makes it clear. I don't have to think about them if each one of them is simple. All right. If you have a giant compound statement, you, you know, six months after you wrote it, you're going to sit there scratching your head like, what does this mean again? Where these simple statements like this, I'll always know what int user choice means, right? I don't, don't ever have to worry about that. I create a die object. All right, die is a singular of dice. All right, I wish it wasn't that because I hate saying die, die, die. All right, but I create my two die. All right, where is that code defined? Well, you can tell die is a class. All right. How can you tell that die is a class? Well, die, die one is saying I have a variable that's going to contain a reference to a die object. 
and I'm making a brand new die object to put in that variable. So die one now is a die object, just like b1 is a boolean, d total is an int, d2 is a int, text box one, well we don't have a text box one, but uh, drop down list one is an object, right? What type is it? It's a drop down list. Label result is an object of what type? It's a label. Image one is an object of what type? An image. Panel one is a panel. So just like those things are objects of their particular type, except we didn't define those types, those are built into the framework. So the framework has all the general purpose objects to build your UI uh, and to do some other things. So it has an object for the drop-down list, and it has an object for this and that. But it doesn't have any objects for dice, right? It doesn't know that you want to write dice games with, with ASP.NET, so there's no object or no class created for that. So we had to make our own class to do what we want our dice to do. So what I'm doing is in the class file, I have sort of the template of the things that a dice does, the things that one die does. And in this problem, I have two of them. So what I'm doing now is I'm making two dice. The die is the class. Die 1 and die 2 are objects. All right? Can anyone give a good definition of the difference between a, uh, an object and a class? Can you open the door again? Maybe someone just walking by will. will. <laughs> Difference between a, uh, an object and a class. A class has more functions going on in the background, and the object is the result? Well, uh, not really. Not really. If you think of a class, how many members does a class have? Look around in this class. How many members are there in this class? It's a bunch of them, right? I don't know, a dozen or so, give or take. When you think of a class, you know, whether you're talking about a class of people, a class of automobile, uh, a class of books, a class of uh, mobile devices. When you're talking about a class, you're talking about a group that share some common characteristics, all right? They have common attributes. So for example, um, students. Students is a class. There's many members in that group, right? It's a group of people. It's a class, is, is a group, another way of saying that. Uh, and when you say a class, it's a group that shares some common characteristics. So it's not just a random group of people. It's a group of people. Student is not just a random group of people. It's a group of people that share some characteristics. What are some of the characteristics? Well, yeah, students have names. Students have addresses. Students have phone numbers. It also share, they also share, the members of the class also share functions and functionality and methods. For example, calculate grade point average. All right, that's a method that every student has. I can calculate the grade point average of every student. That's a characteristic or a behavior, maybe is a better way to put it, or an action is maybe a, a better way to put it still, that I can do to every member of that class. Tell me how many total credit hours the student has. That's an action I can do for every member of the student class. Tell me um, what what courses the student is enrolled in currently. That's an action I can do to every single student of the student class. Think of a class of automobile, all right? Uh, well, uh, or, 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 well, make it even simpler. Think of a, a class of, uh, yeah, think of the class of automobile. All automobiles share certain characteristics, all right? Um, what size tires do they take? That's a characteristic that all automobiles share. Uh, 
what is the body type? You know, is it a sedan or a sports car or whatever? What miles per gallon does it get? What kind of engine does it have? Is it a gasoline engine, an uh, electric engine, or a hybrid? All right, and so on. These are all characteristics that all members of the class automobile share. And when I'm using the word characteristic loosely, because some characteristics are like really simple, like all, all cars have a color, right? But some, class, some of these, these uh, characteristics are like really like calculations or, or actions or functions to talk in programming terms. So when we talk about a class, we're going to define the attributes, that is the variables, sometimes they're called instance variables, that all members of that class have a value for. All right? And we're going we're gonna to define the functions that we can perform for all members of that class. So that's what a class is. We define those things. An object is one member of that class who has their own specific values for those attributes. And if you call a function, you're going to get the results for that one member of the class. So, die is, I wish I would have brought my dice in. I have some on my desk when, when I went over this problem before. Die is a class, right? There are certain things that are true for every dice in the world. All right, and I know this is a computer class, so we're going to limit our talk to six-sided dice. All right, none of those like 64-sided Dungeons and Dragon kind of dice or anything like that. All right. Um, so, what are some characteristics that a dice has that every dice in the world, every six-sided dice in the world has? What are some characteristics that it would have? Yes. It has multiple flat surfaces. How many multiple flat surfaces? Six. Six. All right. What's another characteristic that a dice has? It can roll. All right. It can roll. That's actually, that, that is a characteristic. That's like a behavior kind of characteristic. So they're sort of like behavior characteristics and value characteristics. So you can roll a dice. That's a behavior you can do. That's something you can do, an action or an activity you can do with a die. What are, uh, what are some other things that, uh, characteristics that a dice can have? Uh, they have dots on them. It has dots on them? Leading up to the number of sides that they have. Yeah, leading up, starting at one, going up to the number of sides. No repeating. No repeating, all right. There's one particular side that is most important for a dice. The top one. So... If you think about this, and again, um, when, you're, when you're creating a class, you're essentially creating a software model of something. And any model that you create, there's things that are important and things that are not important. The side that faces left, is that important? Not in any game I have ever played. Now, roll the dice, look at the side on the left, and that's how many spaces you move. You know, I've never played a game like that. Or the, 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 the value that's on the bottom of the dice, is that important? No. The one side that is important when you roll the dice is the top one, the, the, the one that's facing up. All right? So that would be an important attribute. And the other, the, what isn't on top, we really don't care about. So we're not going to have anything in our model about the rest of those sides. We're only going to have something about the side that's showing up. All right. So what are some of the things that we know? We can roll a dice. We, are going to, we, we want to know what side's on top. And we want to know what that side on top looks like. All right. Those are two different things. They're related, to be sure. But they're two different things. The... Side, the, 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 the numeric value of the side on top, we want to use for math, right? Because when we roll two dice in this game, we want to add those two things together. What the, what the dice looks like, what the 
on the screen. Um, think of think of the game Yahtzee, for example. You know, I don't know. Probably many of you have played Yahtzee, where you roll five dice and then you you try to get combinations like all five the same value or four of them or whatever. You can play that game. Imagine like a mobile game version or an online game version of it. You can play that game and just display the numbers, right? You don't have to display dice, but well, that's no fun. You'd want to actually display the dice, all right? So therefore, we want to know what that face looks like, and dices have Dies have a specific look of how they look like. You know, if you have a two, the two dots are, 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 are oriented horizontally. A three, they're, they're uh, not horizontally, diagonally. A three, they're also diagonally. A four, you have one in each corner, and so on. So there's a specific way that dice look. So we want to be able to have our class know what it looks like. All right? So those are the kinds of things that are characteristics of all kinds of dice. We're then going to make two of them, and we're going to do the things that we do to dice and get the results. So let's look at the die class. It gets put by default in an app code folder. If you go to create a class, it will warn you that this class should be in the app code folder if you didn't put it there. And, and just say, yeah, put it in the app code folder. Let's look at this code. <coughs> I have in here two attributes for this dice and two methods. I probably have, should have a third method right. that says get value. I'm going to put that in. Because I shouldn't have to roll the dice to get the value of it. I should just be able to look at the dice and say give me the value of it. So I'm going to put that method in here. When you're creating a class, you're building a component that other programmers can use. All right? We've seen components before in this class. A drop-down list is a component. A label is a component. A, a, a panel is a component. A validator control is a component. All those things are components that someone else built. All right? Because they perform a very generic function. And almost anyone that develops web pages can use that. This is a component that you're building because it's specific to the problems that you're trying to solve. All right, that's really the only difference of it. And we're going to we're going to uh, we're going to uh, create that component. And then here's the nice thing about components: if you create a good component. A person that uses it doesn't really have to know the details of how the component does its job. We've used drop-down lists in this class, and we've used panels in this class, and we've used uh, validator controls in this class. Do we have to know and understand all the details of all the code that was written for those? No. In fact, we can't even see the code. All right? But we know certain things. We know the properties. And we know the methods of that class. And therefore, we know how to deal with that class. And we know how to use that component to do what we want to do. When you create your own component, that is your goal as well. I should be able to give this component to anyone that wants to write a dice game and maybe document it. And they should be able to go and take this component and without even really knowing, for example, like, how do you generate a random number? Or... Um, that's probably the main tricky thing in this one. Not, not that it's that tricky. But uh, you should be able to uh, not have to know the details of that and still be able to use a component. So we have these two properties. Properties, again, are characteristics of this. 
We have a value associated with the dice. That's ma that, that is the value of the, the, the dice that's showing up on top. We also have a component we're using for random generation. All right? So this is a random variable. We don't really need to know the details of how this works. You can sort of trust this. And again, that's the beauty of components. We don't have to know how this generates a random number. We just know that it does. Yeah. All right? So, well, it did at least before I deleted it. There we go. Now, what are the methods that we have? We have a method that says public int roll. Public means that other classes can call this method. Well, that's good, right? We want our game to be able to roll the dice. So we want to be able to call this from our code behind. Int means it's going to return an integer. Well, that makes sense, right? It's going to return the value of the dice, whatever is rolled. And the method to do that is we use a random number generator that we created up here. This line will give us, as I talked about in class on Thursday, Tuesday, today's Thursday, on Tuesday, this will give us a random number between 1 and 6. And we simply return that value to whoever called us. Think of this, and in fact, sometimes uh, in, in programming classes, you can have people to role play as objects. You know, um, for example, do I have a volunteer? Okay, you're my volunteer. When I point at you and say roll, just give me a number from 1 to 6. Okay. All right. Roll. 5. Roll. 2. Roll. 7. Okay. That's the job. Oh, what? 7? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think you meant 6 or a number for you. Right. right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. That's funny. That's what a method should do, and you should be able to do that. You want to have your classes talking to each other. So you can, you can actually have each person play an object and then do the thing that you ask them to do. All right? In this case, there's no argument. All right? They're, they're, I just say roll, and it returns a random number. I then have a method to get that value without rolling, just in case I would need it later on. And I also have a method that returns the st a string that contains the name of the image uh, that contains what the dice looks like. And if you notice in my images folder, the image for each die <laughs> value is D1 through D6. It's in the images folder, and it's a PNG file. So the image name is simply a concatenation of images slash D, that takes me to that directory, the value of the die, 1 through 6, and finally, dot PNG. The one thing I should probably do is set the die to some value initially, and I'm just, for the heck of it, setting it to 1. You could do, handle this all different kinds of ways, but that's the simplest way I'm going to do this. So now, I have a dice component that I can do those things to. Notice that these variables are private. This is one thing that I think I differ with um, the ASP.NET framework and maybe how other teachers teach C Sharp, all right? Is that attributes I always make private. Always, always, always make private. Why is that? So that data can only be manipulated in this class. Because data can only be manipulated through the methods of this class. All right? If I made, for example, the value of this die public, if that was a public property, I could potentially set the value of it to 7 in some code, as we had, <laughs> as someone tried to do a few minutes ago. Right? Or I could set it to negative 8 or whatever, and that would really mess things up. All right? So therefore, there's only one way I can set the value of this dice. That's by rolling it, which is exactly how it should be with a dice. That 
rolling it is the only way I can set the value of it. All right. So, I make these private. My methods, for the most part, not 100%, are going to be public because I want the outside world to be able to interact with this component. If I made everything private, then no one could do anything with that class, right? Because it could do stuff, but no one could interact with it, and that wouldn't be good. So, attributes private, methods public. That's how you interact with classes, is through the methods. So let's go back to our code behind. I've made two die. These are two specific... These are two specific dice, which I can do anything that I can do to a dice. So anything I can do to a dice, I can do to these. They have their own value. I can roll them separately. I can do anything. I then roll each of these dice, and I take the return value and store it in the value D1 and D2. So what does die roll do? It rolls the dice, and stores a value in D1 and D2. D total adds those up. All right, so now D total is going to have the value of both of those dice. B1 equals false. The way the logic of this works is easier to assume that you've lost and look for conditions where you've won. All right, so I'm going to assume that the user loses until I found out that they won. You could write the code the other way, but the code would be a little more complicated. You could assume that they've won and then check to see if they've lost. Each, each problem that you deal with, um, you know, uh, sometimes it's easier to make one assumption versus the other. Yes? I don't know if this is something you could even answer without looking at it, but I attempted to make a method without it being in a class uh -huh. to do our assignment and I didn't I made it without arguments but I, I couldn't figure out how to like store the like the result of that method into it like my int variable okay so if, if you don't make like objects with that function do you have to pass an argument through Does okay that make sense? I'm, all right yeah, that that makes sense uh, I, I think I understand what you're saying I could be wrong. It would be better if, if I saw it, but I, I think I've done enough coding that I can follow what you're saying. First of all, any method you write is going to be in a class, all right? Because even if you don't create a class like I did, this itself is a class. So if you put your code in here, you're not putting in a custom class. You're putting the code behind, but that's really a class. All right, so first of all, yeah, that's what I'm assuming you did. And secondly... If you want to put the result somewhere, it's not the argument that does it. What does it? What allows you to put the result somewhere? The return value. So you'd have to return something from it. All right? Just like here. This dice roll doesn't have any arguments, but it returns the value. So the return value is how you give an answer back. The arguments are... Um, the ingredients, the, the factors that you need to complete the problem. And in this case, I don't need to do anything other than say roll the dice. You know, roll the dice. And it rolls. And then it tells me what the answer is. Okay. So, I have the sum of these. I'm assuming that they lost unless I know otherwise. I grab the user's choice. And if the user's choice is zero, that means they pick low, and D total is less than 7. Let's check the syntax. Remember, double equal sign for comparisons. And combines two conditions. So in this case, with an and, both of these have to be true. So if the user picked low, which is 0, and the total is less than 7, then they won. If the user picked 1, and the total was equal to 7, they won. If the user picked 2, which is high, and the total was greater than 7, they won. If they won, I display, they won. <laughs> if they didn't, I display, they lost. 
Finally, I take and ask each dice, give me your image name. And I set the URL, image URL property of those two images. Set the image URL of, that, of those images to the URL of the image name. Finally, I make that panel true, which again, I probably don't really have to do, but I did. Questions about this? Yes? In your die.cs, um, you had the you had a return there, and then in get value, you also have the return value. Mm -hmm. Why, again? I'm simply giving two functions that give me the value of the dice. One gives me the, one rolls it and gives me the value of the dice. One gives me the value of the dice without rolling it. So, for example, if I roll it, then in some other function later on, I would need to know what, what was the value the last time I rolled it? I could call get value. Okay, that makes sense. So that returns a value without me having to roll it. Yes? But as it's written right now, go up, you have it set at, uh, you have the value set at one, right? Yes. So if you just grabbed it right now, the value, without rolling the die, right. it would just show one. It would show one, correct. If I was doing this for real, what I would do is I'd create a constructor, all right? Uh, for those of you who know what a constructor is, a constructor is what gets called when you first create an object. And I would randomly set okay. the value when I picked it up. So the way it is now, if I just pick up the dice, it, it assumes every die I pick up has one on top. <laughs> All right, which probably isn't a good assumption. I would create a random, uh, a random, uh, when I created the die, I would randomly create uh, the value that it had as well. But I didn't want to get in that. I thought the simplest solution would just be to default that to one. I also maybe would have a set value that would be allowed to, to set the value for different kinds of games, all right? Uh, some games I might want to control what value the dice has initially, for example. So I might have a set value in here. Doesn't re isn't really required for this example. All right, let's run this through debugger, because debugger is a great way to watch the code in action. So let's put our breakpoint Can't put it there. Why not? Because this is a statement that doesn't really do anything. I mean, it does something, but it doesn't do anything that you can really see working. So I'm going to put my breakpoint down here. Did you just like right-click on that? Is that what you did? No, I'm just clicking on that gray area. Oh, it was gray area. Okay. Yeah. So I, I have to click specifically there in that gray area. So now I'm going to run this. I pick that I want seven, and I click the button. So what's going to happen when I click the button? When it hits that line of code, it's going to stop executing, and it's going to show me the lines of code as it executes them. So I click button. I'm at this point. D1 has a value of zero. All right. Why is that? Well, remember, when it freezes on that line, it shows you the value before that statement executes. So an int, if you haven't given the int a value, it assumes the value is zero. So, right now it's zero. And I go in and say step into. It goes into that function on the die. Step into. It's at this statement. Value has a value of 1. Does that mean it was randomly generated? No, it's the value from before. Return value? Well, it still has a value of 1. So that's the value that gets returned. I then return. And when I'm done, D1 has a value of 1. 
They can see the variables down here. I'll step into it again. It's rolling it. I have a six. And I win. Yes, go ahead. Uh, just a quick question. Um, when you run the debugger, the locals and calls and Sorry. panels, those automatically pop up? Yes. Okay. There's other things you can do, though. One is the immediate window. If, the, if it's not, if like something that you want to see isn't shown here, you can type in question mark and put the property of it to execute something immediately. So I could say, I could call the get image name function here, and it'll show me what that function will return. Or, I can uh, do a question mark and, and say the value of a variable. And it will show me what the value of that variable is. Uh, exception settings. I, I don't know what that does. <laughs> I've never used that one. Uh, I assume it allows you to, to be interested in what, uh, what uh, things get called. Watch, you can define variables that you want to watch all the time. Um, and it will show you the value. So we rolled a six this time. So D1 has a value of one, D2 has a value of six. It's even nice enough to highlight that six, I believe, because that's the last thing that changed. I can then continue on execute. The total is seven. I assume that they've they've not won. I grab the user's choice, which is one. The user choice is zero, and d total is less than seven. Is that if statement true? No. The user choice is one, and d total is seven, so seven is not less than seven. So this if statement is going to be false. So it's going to show it jump over these statements because it's false. If user choice is 1 and d total equals 7, then they've won. Well, yeah. I picked user choice of 1, which means I picked a 7, and I rolled a 7. So I go in here. Ah, sets the B1 value for true. Finally, I check if user choice is 2 and D total is 7. And that's not true. Now, you could write these if statements. These three if statements I've wrote as three separate if statements. You could write them as one if statement with a bunch of else's. You could write them with a case statement. I, I or, or select case statement. I generally go for just the most straightforward, simple way. In other words, if I wrote this with ifs and elses, those ifs and elses would be a lot more complex and harder to read. Yeah, I check all three conditions every time. All right? So what? All right? You might say once you know that you won, why bother checking any other conditions? Well, the amount of time that it takes a CPU to do that is so small that I don't really care about that. This isn't like 1977 with the processors that you had back then where you tried to shave every possible millisecond off of your coding. All right. Um, so if the code um, has a little bit of, you know, stuff that uh, instructions that don't absolutely have to be done, executed, but it makes the program look clearer, then I'm all for that. Okay, if B1 is true, B1 is true. Why does it just say B1 instead of B1 equals something? By the way. Notice in all my other if statements, I say if this equals that. For here, I just say if B1. Yes. 
Well, with uh, like, if you if it if you wanted it to be false, you would do if d one is equal to false. But if you just do d one, it's taking it knows that it's a boolean and it defaults it to true. Okay. Um, I think you're you're right. Let me just rephrase that a little bit. All right. Anytime you have a condition in an if statement, it gets boiled down to a Boolean. In other words, in this case, I say if user choice equals 2 and d total is greater than 7. So I figure out if this is true or false. I figure out if this is true or false. I then figure out if both of them are true or false. When I'm done, I come up with a Boolean. All right? By doing those comparisons, doing the ands, doing the ors. In this case, I don't have to do any boiling down. It's already a Boolean. All right? So my condition, if B1, is the same thing as saying if B1 equals true. All right? Uh, because B1 is a Boolean, it's already boiled down. So the, 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 the server doesn't have to do any sort of comparisons to determine if that is true or false, if that condition. It's a Boolean variable, which already is true or false. Do you yes. know if that is applicable to other .NET languages? That is, uh, that would be, if, you, if there's a Boolean variable, you should be able to put that, any programming language I've seen that has if statements and Boolean variables, you can do this in. And B1 is true, so I set the label to you won. Otherwise, I set the label to you lost. And then I get the image name, which returns the image for the first one, sets the image URL property, does the same thing for the second one, and finally returns a value, of, uh, makes panel visible true. And there we go. All right. So the debugger is useful to, to see exactly what goes on when you execute something. All right? So it's even a valuable tool for learning like how my examples work. So you can take and run those through the debugger and see uh, that. Now if there was something wrong, if it said I rolled a 7 and I lost, I would use that debugger to like trace through each thing instruction by instruction and see like what went wrong. Did do the calculation wrong? Is the uh, dice object returning a, a goofy value? Um, all kinds of things could be wrong. All right. The one advantage of using components like this is you can reuse them and uh, uh, you know use them in different places. The one disadvantage is sometimes it makes testing a little harder because a few different things could go wrong. You could have your component go wrong. You could have other code going wrong. Both codes could be right, but they don't talk to each other right. So, uh, again, the debugger is a valuable tool to use in determining that. Questions about this? Now, one thing that we're going to talk about next time, but I want, do want to spend some time to talk about uh, rock, paper, scissors, is we have another... We don't have the full version of this. I'm not sure what we have later on in the examples. But we have a Yahtzee page. That gives me five dice. All right. Well, guess what? Do I have code duplicated five times? No. I simply have five die objects that I call the different methods on and get that. So I've taken that code that I wrote for one thing, and now I can use that code for something else. Now, of course, I don't have the rules of Yahtzee done yet for this. But again, that would be, um, that would be the next step with this. But the nice thing is I don't have to write a function. Whoever wrote this doesn't have to create a dice. They just need to know how to use it. That there's a role function, there's a get image name function, and go to work. Okay. All right. Now, getting back to your question about rock, paper, and scissors. Here's how I see the rock, paper, and scissors game working. And you can tell me if I'm what I'm saying here. It's always useful.
useful to me to think, first of all, what components are going to be on my UI. All right? So what components do you see on the UI? paper, scissors. Do you have to have a drop down? No. You could, you could, um, you have radio buttons, for example. Would you want to use a text box? No. Why not? It could, yeah. It could spell scissors wrong or rock wrong or something like that. Hey, scissors is not an easy word to spell, all right? Okay, rock is pretty easy, all right? But, you know, is it case sensitive, you know? <laughs> You're liable to, someone's liable to mistakenly type in Dwayne Johnson instead of rock, and, you know, and it just wouldn't work. Oh, come on, that was funny. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we have a drop down with that. I'm going to say we have a button, all right? And the reason we have a button is I don't want to have make the user change their, cho their choice. Because if I write code on the dropdown on the item change method, even if I make it auto post back, if they want to roll rock again, they can't do it because they're not changing it. Therefore, the code won't run. So I'm going to put a button to go. That way, that will let them keep their, keep that and say, I want to play again. What else am I going to have on this? Three image controls. Well, two image controls. We have two image controls. What are these image controls going to be? Player and computer. Player and computer. So image player, let's say, and image computer. What else am I probably going to have? A label that says... A label. One. A label that says if you want or not. All right? Yeah. Anyone think of anything else of me what we might want on that page? Maybe we could have something to make the page more usable. So we could have we could have you know headings, explanation, and so on. Sure. We might want a validator control on the drop down, and we'd want anything that would make you know we'd want to style the page look good and all that. All right. So what is going to initiate the processing of this? What starts the rules? What starts the code in, in motion? You have to click the button. Right. So we're going to have a button click event that's going to do this. Describe. Describe what the code's going to look like. sort of form a plan. 
In the old days, we wrote flowcharts, and you could still write flowcharts. But putting the comments in is another good way to do that, to sort of think it through. Really, for a lot of programming tasks, the hard part is deciding the steps that you're going to follow. The easy part is figuring out, well, what's the C-sharp instruction to do that? All right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get the user's choice. Users. And we know how to do that, right? It's going to be based on the value of this dropdown. What's the next thing that we want to do? Well, we have a validation control to handle that. Oh. All right? Okay. We want to generate the computer's choice. What's the next thing we want to do? Test if you want. Test if you want. This is where they say the devil is in the details, right? Because there's a lot of different ways you could write this code, all right? Um, essentially what you want to do is you want to test to see who won. And we're probably going to set a Boolean. Oh, can this be a Boolean? No, why not? There's more than two outcomes. There's more than two outcomes, right. So I can't simply say, did you win or lose, right? Because you could win, lose, or tie, all right? So it's not a Boolean. Did you win? Yes. Did you lose? Or did you, did you win? Yes. Did you win? No. Well, did you tie or not tie? Or did you tie or outright lose? So you're going to have some variable. You're going to have to keep track of that somehow. You might do something like an integer, where negative 1 means that you lost, 0 means that you tied, and 1 means that you won. That would be, that would be the scheme that I would pick. Just going to make sense to me. But you know what? As long as you did it consistently, it wouldn't matter. You could, you could make winning 99, losing 100, and tying 101. As long as you coded it in a way that made sense for you, it really wouldn't matter. So, you're gonna, and you're going to set some variable that has the results. Now, the testing is going to look like this. You're going to be comparing. You're going to have a series of comparisons between the user's choice and the computer's choice. That you're going to use to see if they've won or lost. How many possibilities are there in rock, paper, and scissors? Nine. There's nine. All right? Three options for each person. So if I pick rock, Opponent could pick rock, paper, or scissors. If I pick paper, rock, paper, scissors. If I pick scissors, rock, paper, scissors. So there's nine possibilities. So worst case scenario is you have nine if statements. All right? We could do better than that, though. How can we do better than that? Yes? Set it up so like if you pick the same, you pick the same like you, you give each one a value or something. Right. So if you pick the same value, the value exactly, then that automatically is like your right. Tie. Exactly. You can you can simplify things a bit by saying if the user three of the possibilities are, are the user picks the same thing as the computer does. It doesn't matter if it's the user uh, and computer both pick rock, both pick paper, both pick scissors. So if they pick the exact same thing as a tie, you can just say that, and then you don't have to do any more testing. All right, and then, then you only have six possibilities to check. So well, we've, we've simplified it a little bit. All right, when we're done, we're going to have three things. We're still going to have the user choice, 
we're still going to have the computer choice and we're going to have our outcome. outcome variable. How are we going to use those to display this page? Well, we use the user choice to display that image. Use the computer choice to display that image. And then finally, we use the outcome to display the label. Tuesday we could talk about what if we wanted to use a class for this because all this code is written assuming it's just part of the main thing which fine we can get to work but then to class did that kind of answer your question or okay good all right I don't know what time it is I assume it's past our time it is all right uh, I will go and unlock the lab and then I will be back over here to grab the stuff